guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a recent graduate of Cambridge University. So this is part of a series that I've been doing for the whole of 2022, where I talk about the historical inspiration of our favorite TV shows and films. Today, I'm very excited to say that we're gonna be talking finally about the first episode of Moon Knight. If this sounds like the kind of thing you might be interested in, don't forget to like this video and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any. Especially because I'm going to be talking about every single episode of Moon Knight as it is released. Generally, if you're interested in fun, ancient historical content, don't forget to check out my other social medias. Obviously, because we're talking about the first episode of Moon Knight, massive spoiler warnings ahead. If you haven't watched this yet, what have you been doing, but you may want to watch this video a little bit later. If you haven't seen it but you're not bothered about the spoilers, also don't worry because I'm going to be trying to talk my way through the plot chronologically so you're still going to understand what's happening in the episode and what I'm talking about historically. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm just going to say now that the first episode did not disappoint. Throughout all of the teasers and trailers, I have been so excited for the release of this series because not only am I myself an Egyptologist, so I'm very excited, I'm also a massive fan of Oscar Isaac. I think he's an amazing actor and a Marvel fan generally. So it's like everything I love kind of got to come together into one series and it did not disappoint. Generally, I couldn't find many inaccuracies, so that is a massive thumbs up. I think it's probably the most accurate thing that we have reviewed on this channel. The episode starts with the character named Arthur Harrow. We see him performing some sort of weird preparation ritual, for want of a better term. We see him drinking from a glass of water and then using a very weird staff to break this glass and placing the shards into his shoes, which he then walks on, which if you have any level of cringe with these things, that was an uncomfy scene. During this, we also see an interesting tattoo on his wrist. And this somewhat matches the head of his like walking stick. And it shows a weighing scale with the head of a crocodile either side. And this I shall get into a little bit later change scene we meet our main protagonist played by oscar isaac who is called stephen he's waking up to start his day at work but weirdly is chained to his bedpost has set a ring of sand around his bed and then like tape down his door which you can guess is so that he can know if he's leaving or coming to his bed at any point during the night very interesting behavior so he goes to work and we learn that his workplace is none other than the British Museum. However, it's not quite as good as we first think as we learn that he's simply working in the gift shop. As he enters the museum, he encounters one of like the primary school children and she is sticking gum on one of the models of the pyramids, which rightly so upsets him a little bit. So he says that she needs to be careful, otherwise some of the ancient Egyptian gods are gonna come after her. During this talk, he also talks about the idea of mummification, and he describes how they would use a long poker, stick it up the inside of the nose of the deceased and take out all of the organs. All they would leave was the heart, so that they could judge whether the person was good or bad. If they were good, they could then successfully pass through to the field of reeds or the afterlife. Generally, this is a very accurate summary. Because he's describing it to a child, we can ignore some of the oversimplifications of it. One being the fact that this long rod would obviously not be used to remove all of the organs. This was just to remove the brain. This rod would break through your ethmoid bone in your nose and, as it's described in The Mummy, would jiggle about your brain until eventually you would remove it all. However, the rest of your organs were removed through an incision on the side of your abdomen. These and the brain were generally removed, we think, because it would help preserve the body. And it is a key idea in Egyptian mummification that the body had to remain whole and preserved in order to successfully pass to the afterlife. So they want to do whatever they can to best preserve this. So this involves removing these organs which are more likely to decay and make the rest of the body decay, 
alongside applying oils and natron salts to dry up the rest of the body. The idea of the heart being the only organ left is also very true. Of course, there are varying standards of burials. Not all of them could afford the full burial where they'd have their organs properly removed and preserved. Some of them, unfortunately, did have their organs left in. Some, even the wealthy, also had their brains left in, and this is something that we're still studying to this day, and the British Museum itself is doing a series of talks on recently. The heart, however, was kept because they believed that they needed this for the weighing of the heart, and this is one of the trials that they would have to pass in order to reach the afterlife. If it outweighed the feather of Ma'at, which is one of the Egyptian goddesses, it was believed that you hadn't lived a true and virtuous life. As a side note, did anybody else think his interaction with the child was a little bit strange when she says, were you upset? I can't remember exact phrasing, but it's something like, were you upset when you were rejected from the field of reeds? And I thought that was really weird. And then if you have seen the episode, you know that it's obviously weird later on with a lot of the workers also turning out to be a little bit suspicious. After this interaction, he goes to his gift shop job, where his manager is not very happy as he's late once again because he missed the bus because it was early and had to get on a later one. So she gives him some pretty basic not nice tasks like stock, also just standing at the counter and selling these kinds of jelly sweets. And he makes a kind of jibe at the fact that what does this actually mean or represent in ancient Egyptian culture? Instead, he talks about how they were eating figs and dates. And this is very true. These were kind of the main fruits that the ancient Egyptians would have had access to and would have eaten. More generally, their diet throughout the year would have consisted of mainly bread and beer. Then, of course, with the more elite people, they have a more varied diet, but generally, for the common people, this was all they were having. In the stockroom, Stephen is told to put away the cuddly hippos, and he rightly corrects the woman working there that this is Tawaret. And this was a real ancient Egyptian hippo goddess. If you know anything about ancient societies and their religions with pantheons of gods, you will know that gods are often equated to certain qualities. And for Tawaret, she was the protector of childhood and birth and fertility. Generally, scholars believe that this is because the ancient Egyptians recognised how ferocious and dangerous the hippo could be as a creature and wanted to harness these powers and use them for protection. Stephen's character then talks about the posters of the museum that are advertising the Ennead. He talks about how the posters feature just seven of the gods, whereas the Ennead were a group of nine of them. And this is absolutely correct. While all the deities separately were worshipped across the majority of Egypt, the Ennead are specific to the area of Heliopolis. These nine gods included Atum, Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Set and Nephthys. This group represents this idea of a creation mythology. Mythology in ancient Egypt is often very varied. So there are about three main creation myths, with the Ennead being one of them in Heliopolis. Even within this same narrative, there's differing accounts where the narrative starts to vary a little bit. Generally, they agree that the god Atum emerges from the primordial waters called Nun and he is self-creating. From him and his bodily liquids, either spit or other things which I'm going to leave to your imagination, he created other gods. He creates the duo of Shu and Tefnut, who then become a couple. Yes, a little incesty. You kind of need to get used to it with Egyptian mythology. From them, Geb and Nut are produced. They then bear Osiris and Isis, Set and Nephthys. During his day at work, Stephen's character gets asked out on a date by one of the women who work there as a lecturer. So this is important for a little bit later. After he finishes work, there's lots of sad moments where you see him talking to just a stranger in the street, on the phone to his mum. He goes home and we see that he's trying to keep himself awake at night by doing lots of different puzzles and reading lots of different books. However, it is never
inevitable that he ultimately falls asleep. When this happens, he wakes up in a completely different country with a very loud and intimidating voice booming in his head and occasionally a figure appearing behind him. In this country, he is being chased by lots of different people who are trying to kill him. Running away, he meets the character of Arthur Harrow. And this is where we see him performing a ritual of sorts, where he uses his staff with the crocodile heads, balances it on the wrists of another and places his hands in their hands. And he says that he is judging whether they are good for this world and the afterlife or if they are not. The first man is very lucky. The second old woman is not. And she... This is where we see his tattoo become animated and we see the weighing scales in action. We also learn that he is a servant of the goddess Amit. And again, this is a very real Egyptian goddess. As we see from the depiction on the staff in his tattoo, she is part crocodile. However, she is also part lion and part hippopotamus. His talk about the afterlife and the underworld also makes sense because that is typically where she is located and described as the devourer. If you did not pass the weighing of the heart scene and you were judged not to be truthful and honest, you were eaten by Amit. Which kind of makes sense where he's acting as her servant and doing this work for her. We also see that Stephen's character has now required this gold scarab amulet. In the episode, we don't learn a lot about this other than the fact that he can't let go of it and needs to continue to protect it. So, because we don't know a lot about it yet, I'm just going to tell you the Egyptian history behind the scarab. Scarabs and scarab amulets serve multiple functions in ancient Egypt. While they could simply be used as seals by royalty, they could also be used as a protective item of jewellery. And scholars believe this is because the scarab itself is evocative of the idea of rebirth and renewal, as they witnessed how they would roll a circle of dung, much like the sun would roll across the sky. And this is how we also got the god Kepri, who also is associated with rebirth and renewal. So by wearing this jewellery, you could harness this power and it would act as a sort of protection. It was also used within a burial context for various reasons. One of them being, it would be placed next to your heart in order to protect it in the weighing of the heart scene. So that could be quite important. Stephen realises that his body is being controlled by this voice in his head as he tries to return the scarab to our antagonist and fails to do so. We then see him almost black out and then reappear with lots of things having happened, specifically violence. As this continues to happen, we learn about his alter ego named Mark. Eventually, he wakes up back in his bed and presumes it has all just been a dream. However, he starts to realise something weird is happening with his pet fish having grown a fin and having lost two days of his memory, which unfortunately means he misses his date, which is really sad. Coming home from his date, he realises scratch marks have appeared along the base of his table and the floor. He moves the table to fill these scratches and realises that there is a kind of gap in the like top of his wall where stuff is hidden, specifically keys and a phone. When he goes onto the phone, he realises that somebody has been calling a person named Layla repeatedly. As he goes to call her, she actually starts calling him. He answers and she refers to him as Mark. And this is when we start to see Mark appearing in his reflections and things start flying around the room and he starts to run away. And then finally, we meet the god Konsu. I talked a lot about Konsu or Konshu in my previous video, so I'm not going to talk about it here in a lot of detail, so do go and check that one out to learn a little bit more about him. Generally, the main thing you need to know is that he is the Egyptian god of the moon, which makes sense in a series called Moon Knight. On his way into work the next day, he realises that he is being followed again. He also realises that a lot of the employees in the museum are on the team of these bad guys. And once he refuses to give up the scarab again, this jackal creature starts chasing him. My best guess would be this jackal creature is a representation of Anubis, or as we see in a lot of film and TV, the servants of Anubis. 
And this makes sense because once again, he is another god of the underworld, and it was actually Anubis's job to perform the weighing of the heart scene. Finally, as he's being chased, we see him transform into Mark or Moon Knight. And he pretty much destroys this jackal creature. And that is the end of the episode. And that is all we're going to have time for today. So if you enjoyed that, don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss my review of the next episode. And I'll see you next week. Bye!